This is the plan of the Alexandra Road development, which at that time was much the largest of the housing schemes, which was done by the London Borough of Camden. And they wrote in their brief that it should be housing to the highest allowable density, though they gave us a density figure of 130 persons to the acre, which was then increased to 150 persons to the acre. But they also asked for a school for handicapped children, a community centre, a building department depot, the integration of existing housing on the southern part of the site, a uh, youth club, and above all, to use the space which was available for the housing to construct a public open space for an area in which there was a deficiency in recreation space. However, to that enormously heavy brief was later added further recreation requirements um, in the public open space, including a play centre and a home for uh, handicapped adults. So <clears throat> it became just about as elaborate and socially laden a brief as a local authority could possibly put together. Um, and it was done at a time when there was still confidence in high density. Well, to cut the story short, we ended up with a density of 216 persons to the acre, which was the actual highest allowable density that current legislation could possibly permit. If you look at the site plan, you will see that despite these heavy ramments, its primary characteristic is that of a normal London square plan. So the overall form is a traditional form. All the things which are uh, exceptional or reinterpreted take place, as it were, within that, rather than the overall forms of the building describing something which is exceptional. Behind the scheme, which shows on the plan, is the railway. And it's the most heavily used passenger line out of London with enormous noise levels. And we built a wall of building against the railway and solved the noise problem within the wall of the building. And it gives us this long, thin uh, building with a walkway or street which runs down the middle of it. Um, and in order to follow the railway from the very start, we drew the building on a soft curve. So that though it is an enormously long building, when one looks down it, it has a degree of ease, it relaxes in a way, into the site in the idea of belonging. Um, so there are two strips of housing, each with a walkway down the middle of them, one of them with two uh, terraces of new housing on either side, then there's the public open space, and then to the south of that, two more strips of housing, one new which faces the open space, and the other integrating into it the old housing, which was built immediately after the war. Then in the middle, what is actually the heart of the scheme, is where all the walkways come together, um, and they continue on the right to the next main road. At the end of the public open space, and at the meeting of the two strips of housing, at the very heart of the scheme is symbolically and appropriately the right place for the community centre, and we raised the community centre on a mound of earth so that it's at the upper walkway level. And it looks down the site. Behind that is the main vehicle centre of the scheme. Um, and then tucked away behind the walls is the school for what were then called the mentally handicapped children. And that's designed as a secret garden. It's also designed so that it has access into the direct access into the public open space and direct access to the community centre and also direct access to the youth club, which is the little lump overlooking the uh, vehicle area. And it has its access into the gardens of the school as well as into the public gardens. So there were very strong ideas of social structuring um, in the producing of the architecture. And actually it is my idea in any case that a very important part of putting together a scheme of any sort is to recognise the interrelated identity of all these pieces. And that indicates a characteristic of Alexander Road. Another problem um, comes in, and that is the problem of urban composition. And I think, actually, it is the, it's the only scheme that I know which has this characteristic of being a single, single simple, continuous um, composition, a, a composition of buildings <coughs> and, and form in a way characteristic of more uh, aspects of 18th century planning than certainly uh, contemporary 20th century planning. Um, if we look at the next slide, which is an aerial view of the scheme, 
Uh, it's looking down the public open space, uh, and on the left are the lower terrace and the upper terrace uh, with their slight curve running against the railway. The left-hand terrace is seven stories high. You can then just see the red brick walkway, and then in front of that, a four-story terrace with another walkway with, in front of it. And then there's the public open space, which has got lots of white bits in it, and those are uh, playgrounds. Uh, the, the nearest one is a football pitch, um, playgrounds for children of various ages dotted down the scheme. Um, it was a requirement, in fact, that these should be recognisable units of space. And at the very forefront of the photograph, there's an incomplete building, which you can just see scaffolding and walls for, and that was the play centre, which was added as addition to the brief. And then on the right... And balancing the low terrace on the left, um, it's a three-storey terrace of housing over one floor of garaging, so they're the same height. Um, and those give a certain degree of broken symmetry, as it were, to the blocks on the left. And then beyond that, the existing buildings, with another walkway in between, which are the same height as the big building on the left. So because of the way the walkways work, connecting the main streets at either end, that walkway is a public walkway, and the scheme constitutes a public part of London. Um, the next slide shows the section, which is the key to the whole thing. And there in the middle, you see the open space with trees and a certain amount of mounding. Well, uh, what we did was uh, take excavated soil from the construction and make a sculptured landscape into a whole series of rooms. On either side of that, are two four-storey blocks. Um, on the left, two masonettes, lower dwelling and an upper dwelling, overlooking that open space, and on the right, three-storey, the largest six-person houses. But the main thing is that on the left, it is either two blocks of housing or a single block that is, in a way, split in two. And where it is split in two is where the walkway runs down the middle, and the scheme, the housing on both sides, faces, as it were, into the walkway, in the traditional way of the feeling of a building addressing the street. Um, and that gives a paradox, because the low block addresses the street to the north uh, with the upper dwellings, and the lower dwelling has to address the open space to the south, which is done by a device of having uh, the lower dwelling face one way and the upper dwelling face the other, which means that its, as it were, back wall can constitute the long, continuous surface to the open space in the traditional way. And the inside space becomes then a complete discussion, as it were, of terraces for each dwelling and the access system, which was the access system that was in a way derived from the Lillington Street housing, a staircase which mounts the building between two dwellings on either side. Between every two dwelling is a staircase which goes up the middle of the building, starting with its very bottom at the walkway level. And it goes up to the, the next to top floor where there's another continuous walkway which runs down the length of the scheme. So this upper walkway and this lower walkway are linked together all the way along the scheme by these staircases. Then, at much greater intervals, are lifts. And the lifts connect the roadway at the very bottom, the walkway down the middle, and the upper walkway. By this method, every single front door feels that it is related to the street and to the city in the traditional way. At the top is a masonette, much like the Fleet Road masonettes, with kitchen, dining, living room on the top floor, and the balcony that over is then your private garden, overlooking the rest of the scheme, the open space. Below that are three floors of two-person dwelling, each again with its large outdoor terrace, like, a, like an outdoor room, facing south onto the walkway, and below that, another five-person dwelling, again with its garden facing onto the walkway, and an extra high living room because it's relatively low in the section, and it means that it gets winter sunshine all the time into the lower dwellings. Below that, um, and below the walkway, is a continuous garage with a road that runs down the middle and further garaging underneath the building at the back. Those two roads are linked together, and the road underneath the the walkway is naturally lit and ventilated all along the way by an opening so that it doesn't feel like a fully buried road. And then to the right of that are the two masonettes I've already referred to and across the section the other ones and the existing housing. So that looking at it, it is a, a composed 
form um, with a balance of symmetry, about two walkways and the open space um, with the railway behind. If we go to the next slide, there's a view down the walkway. The walkway is red brick paved and the face of the buildings are white concrete. And you can see a group of women with trams sitting on continuous benches. Behind those continuous benches is a planter. Uh, and by, literally behind the ladies, just a little way further along, uh, is the first of the staircases. And if you look down the section, you'll see that the staircases repeat and repeat all the way down the building. Um, and behind them, uh, to the left, is the... Uh, ventilation and, and sunshine gap into the garage below uh, and the terraces. And uh, the entire surface of the building is an expression of the dwellings behind in one way because it's nothing but these terraces and planters, uh, but that set another architectural problem as to how to find an architectural language which was not directly dominated by the simple expression of dwelling after dwelling after dwelling, but became a problem of composition as to how to do this as an, as an architecture, using these as elements of an architecture, which is something not the same thing at all as the simple expression of the identity of the spaces behind. Next slide shows the public open space, the small open space or square uh, in the middle of the scheme, and it's the, uh, where all, as it were, of the walkways come together with staircases and a sunken garden um, and ramps. And the slightly shadowy shape at the top of the photograph is the community centre at the end of the public open space. And to the left of that, the bottom of the chimneys where the group heating uh, the power plant was. Um, and you see that to the very... In the very left of the open space is a little, as it were, seating bay. So this was a very composed, very formally composed, um, a, a small central area. And the next photograph is looking, as it were, in the other direction from the sunken garden to the housing behind. And in, immediately in front of that is a double staircase, a staircase which starts at walkway level, goes on a semicircle to a platform and down to a lower platform, and around a drum, the drum of another staircase, uh, which is inside that one, which goes from the walkway down to the garage level. The two obviously interrelate at the bottom. But as with all of these elements, there is an, uh, a great pleasure, an enormous enjoyment. Um, in designing these not only as staircases and platforms and walls, but as uh, expressive and sculptural events forming part of this compositional aspect uh, that I'm trying to, to, to talk about and, and trying to also to say that unless this aspect is in the consciousness of the people who are designing uh, at this scale, though the pieces that you might make can be quite nice, if they don't add up and fit together, uh, you won't make a, co a coherent environment. And the next slide shows the view down the public open space from the level of the community centre uh, and the children's play spaces, which are nestled into it. Beyond them, a green space. And then way down at the end uh, is, the, is the play centre. Everyone approves of having playgrounds and provision for children, provided they're not by their own house. So the problem is how to integrate these in a way so that the people who have to live near there don't feel that they're dominated by it. Well, the way that we approached this was to sink these playgrounds half a level into the ground with, uh, therefore, very low walls around them from walkway level, but quite high walls around them when you're in those spaces, um, and design a big trellis uh, on the side where the houses are. And because of the long, thin, narrow characteristic of the open space, we designed the, um, the geometry of all the playgrounds and all the things in the open space on the diagonal, so that all the walls on those diagonals appeared longer. The delusion of the space was that it was a great deal wider than it was. It allowed for a complexity of outdoor room by using these diagonals, which we could not otherwise have achieved. Um, and the next photograph which is looking at the wall of the four-story four block. Uh, on the right of that would be the open space. And it is there that the extreme contrast shows between the cellular concrete 
balcony-dominated and staircase-dominated structuring uh, of the spaces which faced onto the walkway, because they all have to do with access and the building addressing the walkway, um, this has to do with an urban surface to an outside space. And it is as uh, simple, as much dominated by surface uh, as we could make it. It does not describe interval of housing. It simply is talking about an urban wall to an urban space in the, the same way that 18th and 19th century housing makes an urban wall to the London squares. Um, that, in a way, is conceptually simple. And, and I'll go to the next slide, and we come to the part which was conceptually anything but simple. Because there we had this enormously long building, which was a section, an unvariegated section, running, uh, I think it's nearly a third of a mile, um, on the curve and on the walkway. And that certain architectural problem is how to handle that in such a way that it became something that you could, as it were, look at and not be either terrified by or dominated by, or for that matter, bored by. Um, and so these, the pieces out of which it was made became the elements out of which we had to create an expressive architecture, which isn't the same thing as the direct expression of the elements. To the left and to the right of the photograph are the way the staircases go up. They have flat walls on either side of them, and the staircase goes up the middle. It is a um, carefully designed element within those walls. The walls, therefore, on either side can be read two ways. One as the walls to the staircases, and then as the walls to two dwellings on either side. And that's the first device. Immediately, instead of having the repetition of endless single dwellings, we have a double module, which allowed for a double scale to run all the way down the, the scheme. So the interval is, that is dominating the design of that is the staircases. Set back from those staircases are the dwellings. And then the dwellings are themselves a setback, which set a geometric and a perceptual problem for us as designers. And the lower dwelling you will see there, where the, the washing is hanging out, um, has a floor slab above it, which is set back from the planter of the dwelling above. And there's a glass area in between. Curiously, that means that as you look down the building, the scale is given by the interval to the bottom of the planter, and not the interval to the dwelling, which is in any case a floor and a half in height. So the lower scale, as you look down the building, is a double height. And then the building sets back from that, with a scale given by the planters and not by the slabs. In order that that should be further articulated, the underside of the slab and the slab itself is a simple rectangle, at the edge of the floor we put a double profile on with a line across it, which meant that in a way it had a different emphasis and a softening. So the main interval is given not by the dwelling, but by the planters. That, and the staircase then comes up to the top of the building where the walkway is. And that walkway gave a thick and heavy spandrel, which then became a continuous curving line down the building, unifying the staircases, and so the dwellings, in a way, all belong underneath that. And above that, the upper balconies for the upper dwellings hover like a cornice. Um, so... Alexander Road confronted us not only with the problem of an urban composition, but it also confronted us with the problem of how to create a, an architectural language out of the elements which were adequate to, as expressive elements uh, for something on that scale.